and she has a long nursing background, more than 30 years I was reading. Never. <laughs> <laughs> it really is hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and she's had a particular interest in putting patients at the heart of everything she does for a very long time. So I'm really interested to hear what you've got to say, and it's, a, it's the first of two local inputs. Thank you very much and for that very generous introduction. I'm not really an expert. I think one of the things that um, we went, we came early to the notion of devolution because it did come out the long grass and was a real surprise to all of us. It was announced, the memorandum of understanding had been signed and there was no conversation with anybody who either worked in the system or who accessed the system. And from our perspective, we represent both our members, nursing and healthcare practitioners, but also we are concerned about service configuration, service quality, and how robust those things are going forward and sustainable. So it was really important to me as a regional director to get a very quick understanding. And we were fortunate in our conversations with Ian Williamson at the time, and he allowed us to second one of our senior officers to work on the Devo project board for two days a week. So we started to develop a really positive relationship, but maybe a more in-depth understanding of what it was. And I think to the credit of the people who had written the plan, because at the beginning it was sort of words on a page that was a lot motherhood and apple pie that you couldn't really disagree with. But the how is that going to work? How will it be funded? How will it be sustained? No, that detail wasn't there. But it has given opportunities, and I see you here from Tameside, for you know, communities like Tameside, and I've seen some of the things in Oldham, and we've seen stuff happen in Salford, to actually start to try and get ahead of the curve and do things differently. Um, but there's a real challenge in that you're doing that at a time when there is economic uncertainty. We really don't understand what's going to happen post-Brexit, because a lot of the financial assumptions were based that infrastructure investment was going to come in from Europe. So a lot of the plans with you know, very uh, challenging targets, like a reduction in the number of cancers in five years' time, you know, changes to obesity and diabetes, and all of those things, which are achievable if you've got the right level of investment, the right level of support in terms of public health, not just information, but people on the ground to help change some of those behaviours are really important. And in fact, what we've seen as a Royal College is a reduction in the number of health visitors, We've seen a reduction in the number of school nurses to parts of this region are actually saying that they have got so few school nurses and limited investment, limited income, that they are looking to reduce the work that a school nurse will do to looking after, you know, safeguarding and looked after children. Now we know that to keep children healthy, it is much more than that. We've actually got to think about the diet, we've got to think about exercise and their emotional well-being. And we're seeing increasingly the pressures on children and young people that leads to self-harm, you know, the suicide rates amongst young men going through the roof. All sorts, you know, the bullying and harassment that really does drive some of this as well as the deprivation that comes from living in some of our communities where housing is poor, opportunities are poor, and people feel disengaged from mainstream society. And it's a lot of it is about deprivation. And if any of you have read the spirit level, you will recognize that the gap between the haves and the have-nots is increasing. The increasing number of women in single parent households probably suffer the worst advantage, and as a result, their children suffer that disadvantage, and their health um, is not as good as it could be when compared to, say, a child living in Kensington. Uh, so from the RCN perspective, we were very keen to get answers to those questions. And one of the things we, we hear and read about in the plan that nobody could argue with is about the activated patient. And I think you talked about people taking responsibility for their health uh, and getting to know a lot about that. But 60 years of what has been a potentially paternalistic system where people went to the doctors and were given a prescription took the tablets or took a sick note and went away. We actually need to re-educate society to think about how they are going to be able to do that, how it's going to work, and a large number of the communities will be able to, to run with that as a model and probably want to be self-caring if systems and planning and things were put in place so they could feel there's control but there's also a safety net. But we do have to invest in those people who lack education, who feel at the margins, who feel disenfranchised and disempowered. And there is, you know, there's a huge body of evidence that says 
people who are disadvantaged have the worst health outcomes because they don't engage and the system is often stacked against them where we start blaming them for being feckless, for not doing the things that they should do to look after their own health. You know, why do they drink? You know, why do they smoke? And these are the social tranquilizers that people use just to make day-to-day -day living palatable. I'm not saying it's okay. I think we need to understand those things and for them to start thinking about taking control of their health is a huge step. And we're not going to turn that around overnight because, you know, generations and generations of deprivation and lack of awareness about their own bodies, their own health, their own well-being. And, you know, things that we take for granted as healthcare professionals, as people who maybe have had, you know, a good level of education. I worked on a coronary care unit many years ago and uh, this chap had come in and he had his third heart attack. And we were saying, we told you, you know, stop smoking try and lose some weight, you know, here's some more leaflets, go and see the GP. And his response back was, well, I know I've got four chambers to my heart, so when the next one blows, I might start to worry. And it was that absolute lack of awareness about how his body worked that led him to think that he had kind of three chances um, and he could still then decide he was going to um, then change his health behaviour. So we have a huge amount of work to do, massive education programme, but the democratic legitimacy that went with Devo Mank, I think, left a lot of people behind. And surveys showed that 80% of the local population didn't even know it happened, didn't know what it meant. And I, you know, I actually, you know, acquiesce to everything you've said about getting people to make decisions about the healthcare. That's the most important thing. Nothing about us without us is the principle that I really think we should be working towards. And when we're talking about accountability at the local authority level, I think the people who are holding them to account shouldn't be the local authority, it should be the people living in those communities. And we need to have honest conversation with them about what we can afford, what we can deliver, and get them to think about what they might want to trade off because there isn't enough resource, and how they might want to change their behaviours to supplement you know, an ever-creaking system with insufficient nurses and doctors insufficient resources and um, it's a massive piece of work that's not going to happen overnight. So, thank you. Thank you.